travel. Yeah, I I should have let you guys know, I forgot. Well, I'll tell you, I did pretty good. Uh, so I drove all the way down. And I drove all the way back. Because uh, the rental man didn't do that. That's what I Good morning, everyone. So, so day. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Delighted to have you here on this uh, Sunday morning, this Lord's Day morning. This is Vacation Bible School. Sunday, or you might call it Vacation Bible School, the aftermath. <laughs> it's a great aftermath. It's a good aftermath. It's a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord, To And they're going to be sharing in their program uh, for the first 20 minutes or so. We'll see how long it takes, however long it takes. And then we'll shift gears uh, to, the, to the worship service proper at that point. But I do want to extend a warm welcome to you. And also, you should have received a bulletin on your way in this morning. And uh, inside, there's a little sermon guide with some things that you'll need a little later on in the service. Just to take, take, set that aside for the moment. And on the very end is a perforated section. Let's just tear that off together. Everybody tearing it off together. Good. And the reason we do that is it, it uh, just encourages you if you have a prayer request or a need, you can place it on the back on the front side if you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time. You're our honored guest and we want to extend a warm First Baptist welcome to you, but we would re request that you share with us your attendance. And so if you want to share whatever information you can there with us, we would appreciate that and the date. And in the back is a place to uh, to drop this little card off. It says it says offering box, uh, but these are also things that could go in there or you can give it to me after the service either way. Uh, and if you came prepared to give, there is, uh, that's what that is for in the back as well. Uh, our members give joyfully, cheerfully, regularly to the work of the ministry here. Uh, all we ask of our guests is your presence today. And we're thankful for it. All right. Uh, so I believe that that is all at this point. And we are ready for our VBS program. So ladies and gentlemen, we're so glad to welcome our children and Dave Hackett, or as it says in your bulletin, Dave Hackett. Thank you, autocorrect. <laughs> but Dava has been our director this week, and uh, she's going to come, and the kids are going to sing songs and share scriptures uh, with us this morning. All right. scripture and now the the little ones learned you want to do you want to yeah let you do the little ones Ephesians 2.10, which is up on the screen. Boys and girls, let's say the verse together. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Ephesians 2.10. And if you detected a little rhythm in their speech as they were saying it, that's kind of how the song goes. The theme song is just exactly those words. So if you ever want to learn scripture, learn it with a song. It's the best way in the world to remember it and to take it to heart. All right. Okay. Thank you, boys and girls. Sit down if you're not a five-year-old. Just sit down. Are you guys ready? We're going to sing Jesus' name. Ready? Let's go. Okay. Okay. Here we go. You ready, Tyson? 
Ready?
Savior died and rose again back to life for me and you. Only one could ever face the cross. Only one could ever save the lost. Who can write his name upon our hearts? And who can give our lives a brand new start? And who reminds us who we really are? Loves us through and through. That's what only God can do. Only one who can reign 
28 people, which was a huge blessing, because when we started playing this, there was like two, and we were like praying and praying, asking for help, so we had a huge, um, great week with that, we had a total of, I think it was 32, did you recount, okay, 30, yeah, 32, I think, enrolled kids, we were, yeah, we yeah. So yeah, 32 kids were enrolled. It was a great week. Um, and for our missions this week, we raised $316, and that went towards um, school supplies. So I was able to go and get school supplies for 16 kids. So that was a huge blessing. So thank you for everyone for praying and all the ladies that helped um, with food. It was We served about 60 people every night. So thank you. If you helped with Vacation Bible School in any way, would you please stand at this moment? We had all ages, really. If you helped with Vacation Bible School, all right, look at the, look around at the helpers, all the, and everyone's a helper in some way. And uh, thank, thank you for those who are the hands and feet, and also for those who prayed for this, uh, this week. We had a wonderful week. They learn so much. The, the thing that I love about Vacation Bible School, at least in these recent years, is that the gospel is interwoven throughout the week. We present the gospel to the older children on one particular night, Thursday evening this, this week, but, uh, but the gospel is there and is interwoven throughout the lessons. So it's, it's never very far away from, uh, from what they're learning. So we appreciate that so much. Well, as we transition now to our worship service proper, uh, we'll have a little bit of a little bit of a reset here. The scripture verse that is our call to worship should appear on the screen just any moment now. There we go. And let's let's read this together, shall we? It's from Psalm 138, verses one and two. It says, "I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart." Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Amen. Well, we continue in worship this morning with... Uh, pardon me for just a second. With prayer, so bow with me in prayer, would you please? Our Father and our God, as we have heard these songs from the lips of children, we are reminded that from the lips of infants and children, you have ordained praise. Or may we come to you today as little children, with childlike faith, ready to receive from you the food of your holy word, ready to be nourished by it, ready to respond to you in praise and thanksgiving. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come and lead us as we sing. I'll give you a chance to sing a little praise to the Lord this morning. Um, if your kids really want to know what those, uh, hear those songs again, we found out that uh, iTunes has that album as the number one kids album this summer. So if you go to iTunes, you can listen to those all the rest of the summer. So uh, we're going to stay together and sing number 206, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord. Glories of my God and Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus, the name that calms our fears. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Tis music in 
in the sinner's ears. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He breaks the power of canceled sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His blood can make the foulest clean. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus washed my sins away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Chet's going to come and share our scripture reading. If you'd remain standing, if you're able.
All right, there we go. All right. Uh, so I'll read the question if you will respond with the answer this morning. And there are also scriptural proofs there. I would encourage you to take this little sheet. It's wonderful to use with your children as you're teaching them these truths. And there's commentary there given as well to help you in that teaching time. So the, que the, the question 15 asks, what are God's work of providence? Answer, God's works of providence are the holy, wise, and powerful acts by which he preserves and governs all his creatures and all their actions. And then question 16 asks, what special act of providence did God exercise towards man when he was first created? The answer, when God had created man, he made a covenant with him that he should live and enjoy all the benefits of creation, but that he would die if he forsook the obedience that comes from faith. God commanded him not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and thus forsake his childlike dependence upon God for all things. So we have heard from God's word. We have confessed our faith in him. And now let us go to the Lord in prayer of confession. And also uh, pastoral concerns will also be shared during this time as well. I want to, especially for us to lift up uh, Josh Scott this morning. He was admitted to the hospital, has double pneumonia uh, at Mosaic. And uh, he's doing better this morning than he was last night. But if you would remember uh, the Scott family and particularly Josh this morning as we pray. Would you join me in prayer? <coughs> Our Father and our God, you are the one who has made us. You are the one who has given us life. You are the one who sent your Son, the Lord Jesus, to redeem us. And for that, we are thankful. We have lifted up our voices in praise and thanksgiving already. And now we come to you humbly on our knees after a fashion to receive mercy from your hand. That as we approach your throne of grace, we would receive that mercy which we so desperately need, Lord. We confess to you that so often, not even, not just this week, Lord, but this very day and this very hour, we have sinned. We have fallen short of your glory. We have transgressed your ways. We have wandered into iniquity. Our thoughts and our Words have not been pleasing to you, not wholly, not wholeheartedly. In fact, Lord, we have not only done the things that we ought not to have done, said the things we ought not to have said, thought the thoughts that we ought not to have thought, but so often we have left undone what we ought to have. When we ought to have given you praise, we have instead gone after other things. Put other things ahead of you. Put other relationships ahead of you. Put other pursuits ahead of you. When we ought to have loved our neighbor, instead, O oh Lord, we have sought to take advantage of him. We have coveted what belongs to him. We have lusted after that which we ought not to have lusted. We have thought thoughts of hatred, which we know is the root of murder. Lord, all of these things, adulterous hearts, murderous thoughts, covetous intents. And Lord, all of these things we bring to you because we confess our guilt before you. And more so, we confess the grace that you have given to us in the Lord Jesus. That through his precious blood and through what he did for us on the cross, we have forgiveness full and free. We have right relationship with you because of what Christ has done. And Lord, we rejoice in that. No guilt, no condemnation is there now for those who are in Christ Jesus. We've laid it all upon you. And so when we sin, 
when we fall short, when we transgress your ways and your laws, when we fail to do that which we ought to have done, we come to you no longer as strangers, no longer as guests, but as children at home coming to a loving Father. And so, Lord, we ask these forgiveness and these blessings through the finished work of the Lord Jesus and receive our cleansing as well once again through what he has done. Lord, we offer up in prayer also intercessions for those who are ill and infirm, several in our congregation who are unable to be with us because of illness. We think about Josh Scott in particular hospitalized and we ask for your hand of mercy and healing to be upon him. Lord, others who are in uh, nursing homes and rehab facilities, we pray for your hand of grace and mercy to be upon them and all who attend them. Lord, we pray for those who are unable to be with us because they are away from home, perhaps on vacation or visiting family. We ask, Lord, for traveling mercies for them and for a safe return home. Now, Lord, how we love you, how we praise you, how we thank you for hearing our prayers, we offer it to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The words from God's Word from Psalm 85, verses 1 through 3, give us great assurance of God's pardon in our lives, which says, Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. The reason we know in retrospect, as the, as the psalmist only knew in prospect, the reason that God's wrath is turned away from us is because it was all poured out on Christ. It was all placed upon Him. All we like sheep have gone astray and have all turned to our own ways. But He has laid the iniquity of us all upon Him. Amen. Amen. Mr. God. Amen. We're going to stand and sing again before Pastor Greg brings the message from God's Word. And so we would stand together. Um, the Bible is full of God's promises. Um, Repent and trust is probably the shortest way I could say the greatest promises that he gave us. Um, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. And uh, we trust in him. Let's stand together. We're going to sing Standing on the Promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Sue. Our praise team this morning, we're thankful for you. And thank you for leading us in our congregational praise. Thank you also for singing. It's wonderful to hear the voices being raised in song. We're just really thankful for that. If you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, if you don't have, there are Bibles in the in the pews, and you can turn with me there to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, we're going to be in verses 1 through 9 this morning as we uh, share in this time of, of uh, 
the proclamation of God's Word. So I encourage you to have that ready and open, either on your uh, printed page or your device uh, of choice. But we're going to be reading in just a few moments those first nine verses of, of Luke chapter 13. But as we prepare for that, I want to just share with you a few things in preparation. And that is, as followers of Christ here in America, we've really grown accustomed to freedom of religion, haven't we? We've grown accustomed to freedom of assembly. We've grown accustomed to freedom of association. We've grown accustomed to freedom of speech. These are things that we take for granted, don't we? It's just something that we think is normal. We don't live in fear that the police are going to come in and shut this service down. We're not in fear that government agents are going to be monitoring our services or that they're going to have spies in the service to make sure that we toe the government line. We're just not afraid of that. We live with every expectation that we'll be able to openly witness to others about Christ's work. We'll be able to welcome others into Christ's way. We'll be able to warn others of Christ's coming judgment. But it's not so in many places around the world, is it? There are places, and we can name many of them, that are places of persecution. Places where followers of Christ are persecuted even at the point of death. We think of Sudan. We think of Yemen. We think of China. We think of Saudi Arabia. Some of these nations are, are, are economic partners of ours. Some of these we, as a nation, are, are afraid to, to, to offend because we wouldn't want to spoil that relationship. But Christians and other religions, for that matter, are persecuted mercilessly in those places. While we sit in the comfortable confines of this beautiful sanctuary, singing our songs of praise with abandon to the Lord, confessing our faith wholeheartedly, praying with fervor and faith, reading the scriptures with boldness, gladly hearing it preached and receiving the food of God's holy word, being nourished upon it, strengthened by it for our lives and for the days ahead. We do so with no fear of reprisal. It's just the last thing on our mind. We freely parked in the parking lot, walked in these doors and sat down and fully expect that we'll rise up at the end of this service and leave from this place without any problem. But persecution of Christians and even martyrdom for the faith is the rule rather than the exception when you consider the broad sweep of Christian history. I want to remind us back several years ago I believe it was in 2015, uh, we were talking about this in the past few weeks, about the beheading of 21 Coptic Christians. If you remember, that was in the news. I believe it was February of 2015. And recently this came up as we were talking about the spread of Christianity in Africa. But just remember that, if you recall, and not to become too graphic here, but that was captured on video by the captors. The thing went viral. We didn't probably see, most of us did not see the fullness of that, but it appeared that some of the men in that video were mouthing the words, Lord Jesus Christ, in prayer, even as they were being executed. Now, my question is, did they trust in Christ alone for salvation? I do not know. We can't peer into their hearts and know exactly what was going on there. Does martyrdom for the faith in any way merit heaven for the martyred? I want you to get this real clear. No, it does not. Martyrdom, the word martyr actually means the same word we would say witness to. That those who have witnessed to Christ and given their life for him. But martyrdom by itself and, and on its own does not in any way merit salvation. Martyrdom may confirm an already existing faith in Christ, but it can never take the place of that faith. And so I want to be very clear on that subject. If you do not have saving faith in Christ alone prior to your martyrdom, becoming a martyr doesn't automatically confer that faith on you and take you to heaven. Now, there is a religion in the world where that is taught. It is not Christianity. It is Islam. In fact, that's the only way that a believer in Islam, a Muslim, 
can be assured that they go to paradise is dying a martyr's death. But not so with Christianity. Unless you truly have placed your saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, that martyrdom will not save you. That being said, I think it's right to express outrage when we hear that so many lives are taken in such a senseless way, in a diabolical manner. But here I point out that I never hear anyone argue this. Maybe you have heard it, but I have never heard it. Those Coptic Christians, or just insert the, in the blank, whichever group is being persecuted or martyred or killed, those Coptic Christians must have been extraordinary sinners to be made to endure such a grisly death. I wonder what they did to deserve such treatment. You just don't hear that. No one, at least not in Western culture today, is saying that. And yet that is exactly what those in Jesus' day would have thought. It's exactly what they would have thought. And they would have thought so as a matter of course. They would have thought so routinely. This would not have been exceptional circumstances. This would have been a way, well, of course, they must have done something or they wouldn't have gotten such horrible treatment in death. That was a common thought. An example of this thought process, you probably will recall if you're acquainted with John's gospel in John chapter 9, you find the healing of the man born blind. And do you remember what the disciples said when they came across this, this blind man? He was, he was there, he was begging, he needed, he needed help. And as they passed him by, Jesus' disciples asked this question, Rabbi, who sinned? Who sinned? This man or his parents that he should be born blind? Well, the automatic and unfailing cultural assumption at that time was that calamity, personal calamity, was the result of some personal sin, not just the result of living in a fallen world. Well, the worldview of our contemporary culture today says that Death by persecution or death by natural disaster is unrelated to personal sin on the part of those who die in them. On the other hand, the prevailing worldview of Jesus' day said that such deaths were commonly, if not always, punishments for personal sin. So which is it? Well, let's see what Jesus says about that in today's Scripture passage, and if you're able once again to stand in honor of God's word, I would ask you to do so as we read Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Hear the word of the Lord. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No. I tell you, but be, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it to put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our prayer is that he would inscribe its eternal truths on our hearts this morning. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. Well, just to bring us up to speed and what's been going on in, in chapter 12 and how it relates to what we're talking about today, I just want to remind you that Jesus has just shared the surprising news that his message and his work would bring division to the closest of relationships. He said that would, that would put, put family members against other family members. Their relationship, their, their 
faith in Christ would bring division to those close family relationships. He's also emphasized the critical importance of settling one's debt with the Lord on the Lord's terms. That's what the immediate context was. And now Jesus responds to those who think that every calamity is God's judgment for being a worse sinner than others. Well, in fact, what Jesus says to the people of his day, he says to those of us here today, all of us. And this is really the, the summary of the sermon. If you're following along, I hope you are in your, in your uh, sermon guide there, you'll see this is in bold print, turning away from sin and to Christ in faith is a matter of eternal life or death. It's a life or death proposition. And Jesus here in this passage describes two sets of contrasting lifestyles, which will ultimately reveal whether or not one has genuine faith in Christ. Now I want you to be sure that and understand what we're not talking about is we're not talking about doing these things giving you eternal life, but rather if these things are present, these lifestyles are present or not, that's the indication of whether you have personal faith in Christ or not, whether you are actually a saved person, whether, you're, whether your faith is genuine. You may claim to be a Christian, but if these things aren't following after you, then that, that you have reason to doubt that. So here we have these two sets of contrasting lifestyles. And the first one is this, living a life with or without repentance. And if you are uh, following along, want to write that word down, the word is repentance. Living a life with or without repentance. So when Jesus was preaching about the necessity of doing business with God and to settle accounts with him at the end of chapter 12, look and, look and see what it says. We'll just go back there and look. It says in verse 57 of chapter 12, And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you'll never get out until you've paid the very last penny. Last time we, we looked at that passage and we, we made the, the affirmation that no one can ever pay fully for their sin. Now we, if we die outside of Christ without placing our faith in Him, then the punishment for that, the penalty for that is eternal separation from God, eternal death, eternal punishment. But Christ took that already for us on the cross. And for those who put their faith and their trust in Him, that is applied to us. But when he, when he mentions this at the end of chapter 12, what did some people do? We see this in verse in, in chapter 13. They came to him and they began talking about the perceived sin of others rather than their own. Now, just an aside, let me ask you a question. Is it easier to discuss the faults of others and the sins of others rather than our own? Just do this. It sure is. It sure is. If that weren't easier, if that were not the easiest thing to do, then gossip would never exist. You know, if we were going around saying, well, I'll bet you never guess what I did to mess up. I'll bet you not never guess what kind of awful sin I found myself in the midst of this past week. I mean, you just never believe it, but I'm going to tell you. Your response to a person that brings, that brings that to your attention is probably going to be one of backing slowly away and maybe even calling, getting some help, you know. It's just not normal, right? No, we talk about other people's sins. We talk about other people's faults. And this is what was going on. Not that that's, that that's good. I do not want to hear you, hear you thinking that I'm affirming that. That's actually wrong. But the implication of the text is that the people who came with these situations to Jesus is that they heartily endorsed the idea that God had used Pilate to punish these particular sinful Galileans for their wrongdoing. And he did it in a particularly grisly manner. It says he mixed their blood with the blood of the sacrifices. Remember, 
what the sacrificial system was about. Offering animals, blood sacrifices to the Lord as a matter of worship. Well, what did he do? He killed them and, and mingled that blood with the animal sacrifices so that it may actually ends up making a, a mockery of the sacrifice. Ends up turning it into a complete travesty. But this is what was this is what was on their mind. This was in the news. This, these were the headlines. But what did Jesus say? How did he respond? Well, he barely lets them get the words out of their mouth when he asks them a question. Do you think? Now let's just stop them and ponder that. Do you think? What is he asking them to do? He's asking them to engage their minds. He's asking them to engage their thought process, to stop and to consider, to meditate a little bit on this matter. Were these Galileans worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Now the form of the question is set up for a positive response. But Jesus responds with an emphatic no. In fact, the no in the original is the kind of no that you get when you're expecting a yes. They, I mean, they just brought this to Jesus. It's almost like a foregone conclusion. Of, well, of course they were worse sinners. And Jesus says, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, whether this was a group of his disciples or whether this was a group from the crowd, it isn't particularly, uh, it isn't say exactly. It just says there were some present at that very time and he has been addressing the crowd. So perhaps this was a group out of the crowd. But he says, no. In fact, one way of translating it would be, no indeed. We'd probably say, absolutely not. Absolutely not. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And if it weren't enough to bring this truth home once, Jesus does it again. He underscores it with this parallel example. The 18 had been killed by the tower falling on them in Jerusalem. So this is kind of a calamity that had happened. They apparently were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Different scenarios, same answer. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, likewise doesn't mean that they're going to be killed or perish in the same way, die in the same way, but that they would just as surely perish if they did not repent. Well, what does it mean to repent? We've been using this word an awful lot, haven't we? I love what J.C. Ryle says in his expository notes on the Gospels here. And I believe he gets it right when he says this. The nature of true repentance is clearly and unmistakably laid down in Holy Scripture. It begins with the knowledge of sin. It goes on to work sorrow for sin. It leads to confession of sin before God. It shows itself before man by a thorough breaking off from sin. It results in producing a habit of deep hatred. For all sin. Above all, it is inseparably connected with lively faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance like this is the characteristic of all true Christians. In fact, if we look at the word itself, the word repent or repentance, in this case it is the verb form, but the, but the noun form of repentance is the word metanoia. Metanoia. Meta, you might see that that. Part of the word, that it's a compound word here, so the first part of the compound word meta, hang with me here. If you've ever heard the word metamorphosis, meaning to change form, it's the word for change. It's the word for change. It's the word for to turn, as it were, as it were. And then noia is just the word for mind. It literally means to change one's mind about sin, but not just the mind. Change one's mind, resulting in a change of heart, resulting in a change of attitude, resulting in a change of direction. We could look at it this way, guys. And boys and girls especially, I want you to hear this, see this example. If you're walking along, just imagine you're marching and, and you're, in a, you're in a military unit or you're in a band or something and someone says, about face, what are you going to do? You're going to turn and walk the other direction. That's the picture of repentance. It's turning and walking the other direction. It's a change of mind resulting in a change of attitude, a change of direction. Now listen, this begs the question. 
Is repentance a one-time turning from sin to Christ? Or is it a lifetime of turning from sin to Christ? The answer is yes. And yes. There must be a decisive point in time when you respond to Christ with saving faith in His finished work on the cross. Some time that you can point to. Now, I don't, I don't demand or require, and I don't think the Scripture requires that you're able to exactly pinpoint the day, the hour, the minute, you know, at 1027 on December 5th, 1984, I gave my life to Christ. Some people are able to do that, and some are not able to. But there must be a point at which you exercise that faith in Christ. And then that repentance then becomes your lifestyle as a Christian. You're walking with Christ. You're wanting to obey Him. You're wanting to do the things He wants you to do. You're following Him. The first step of discipleship in the Christian life is that of water baptism. So you're baptized as a Christian. That might be the thing that you look at and go, well, I definitely remember that. But there's a lifestyle of repentance. Martin Luther put it this way in his for in the first three of his so-called 95 Theses of the Protestant Reformation. I just received a, a t-shirt from a friend this week that had a picture of Martin Luther on it. Actually, it was Sue that brought it to me. And, uh, and it says, nailed it. <laughs> Martin Luther, Wittenberg, Germany, 1517. Well, that was the Wittenberg door that nailed those theses on. I always want to say, you know, there are some people who think he pasted those theses up there. You know, that would have been the normal way to do it. Nevertheless, <laughs> he put it this way. These first three, you should hang with me here. The first one is, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he called for the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. That's the first thesis. It wasn't anything about justification by faith. It wasn't anything about, uh, you know, coming against the, the Pope at Rome. It was this idea of repentance. And it was because the way that the Latin Bible at the time had translated this word metanoia was not repentance, but was to do penance. And so people of that day had gotten the idea, and this was the, this was the doctrine of the church. You do penance. You do things to make up for your sins, in other words. You do things to show that you're sorry for your sins, but that's not repentance. The second thesis was this. The word cannot be properly understood as referring to the sacrament of penance. That's what I'm just saying. I.e. confession and satisfaction as administered by the clergy. Number three, yet its meaning is not restricted to repentance in one's heart. For such repentance is null unless it produces outward signs and various mortifications of the flesh. That is, putting to death of the sins of the flesh. In other words, the change of mind and heart must result in a change of direction. You're going one way and now you're going the other. It's like making a U-turn. When we were uh, out in California to, for the convention, I saw signs that we don't ordinarily see around here and it was at nearly, it seemed like it was nearly every intersection. There was a U-turn sign, a U-turn lane. Just not used to seeing that. I'm used to seeing the no U-turns, you know. They don't want you to do U-turns. But that's what it's about. Repentance is making that U-turn and walking the way of Christ. The second lifestyle here is, that, that's mentioned, the second contrasting lifestyle. You've got the life of repentance or no repentance. I encourage you, choose the life of repentance. Turn to Christ. Follow Him. The second Contrasting lifestyle which reveals whether one is genuinely converted to Christ or not is this. Living a life with or without fruitfulness. And I hope you're following along and writing this down. The first word was repentance. The second word is fruitfulness. This is what we see in verses 6 through 9. Jesus has been talking about repentance. Now he's talking about fruitfulness. He, men he mentions this in a parable. There's another place in scripture where Jesus actually curses a fig tree. And causes it not to bear fruit. This is a parable that he makes. Where a man has a fig tree in his vineyard. So it's fertile ground for the fig tree. Apparently this was not something that would have been uncommon. You think, why a fig tree in the vineyard? Well, 
That's where the fertile ground would be. You would think this would be where it would happen. So Jesus moves on from these popular news stories that, that the people have brought to him. That generates a lot of controversy and, and conversation. He brings them down to a parable. Jesus loved to tell stories. He loved to tell these parables. He loves to bring the truth home by means of a parable. Sometimes he uses a parable to, to make the truth clear. Sometimes he uses it to, uh, to make it more obscure. But he moves from this language of repentance. And by the way, when Jesus says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish, that is actually the language of promise. We sang standing on the promises a few minutes ago. We don't often think about these promises that God makes, these promises that Jesus makes in Scripture. This is a promise of judgment for those who do not repent. Unless you repent, turn to Christ, turn away from sin and self-justifying righteousness. You know, saying, I'm okay on my own. I don't need Jesus. I think I'm just going to be able to go to go to God and he's going to accept me just as I am. You know, that's, isn't that right? You just die and you go to heaven. No, not automatic. In fact, the default position is not heaven. The default position is hell. The default position is, 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 is separation eternally from God's love and mercy and grace and, and eternal being eternally united with his judgment. And condemnation. It's really just a, it's, there's no middle ground there. But that's the language of promise. I want to mention that before we move on. Jesus moves into this parable. And the parable is, by the way, it is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's about the best way to understand that. An earthly story with a heavenly or a spiritual application. That's what Jesus is doing. A parable is not an allegory in which each element stands for something. We don't, shouldn't read it that way. It's, not, it's also not apocalyptic literature like the book of Revelation, which is also highly symbolic. You see symbols there. But in a parable, all of the elements are usually taken together as a story to make one application, just like the previous passage in chapter 12. So he's talking about making, making it right with, the, with your accuser on the way. There's just one truth there, and that is... Get right with the Lord while there's still time. And here we have a similar situation. Now, when he mentions the fig tree, we need to understand that the fig tree was Israel's national symbol. They understood that to be representative of them. So it's obvious that Jesus is directing this parable to the nation of Israel. Here's what he's doing. He's giving them one final opportunity to repent. And turn back to God by accepting him and his work. At the point of verses 1 through 5 was repent or face the consequences. And I believe that's what it is. The point of verses 6 through 9 is repent now or face the consequences. The, the emphasis here is on the urgency of it. Tell me if I'm wrong. Not right now. Wait. But tell me if I'm wrong. We place things that are not urgent, that can wait, in places of top priority to be addressed in our lives. And we leave the things of utmost urgency, of utmost importance, for another day. There'll be another day to repent. There'll be another day to turn to Jesus. There'll be another day to make things right. Because right now, I'm, I'm really interested in this thing, this earthly, pretty thing in front of me, this bauble, this, this shiny object that has my attention. And I don't have time for that other stuff. I hope you have time today to consider what's, what the Lord is saying. Repent now or face the consequences. The urgency of the matter is pressed home in this parable. When he says, this fig tree 
was planted in the vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it. He found none and he said to the vine dresser, look for three years I've come seeking fruit on it and find none. Now the third year would have been a mature tree. You would think there would be fruit by that year. He hasn't cut it down at this point. There has been some, some uh, forbearance, if you will. But now he said it's time to cut it down. Jesus knew that he would face rejection. And he knew that that rejection would come from his own people, the nation of Israel. Remember what John wrote in his gospel, John chapter 1, verses 11 through 13, when he wrote, He, meaning Jesus, came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, that is, they put their faith in Christ, they committed their entire selves to him, with a repentant faith, he gave the right, that is the authority, to become what? Children of God. Sons of God. We say children because that's the, the, uh, the, the, the word that means both boys and girls. Men and women. He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He's talking about the new birth, not just fleshly birth, not just the, the birth that brought us all into this world, flesh and blood. You know, did we have anything to do with that, by the way? No. Our parents did. We had no say in the matter. We simply, in fact, not one of us, I hope not one of us can remember the time when we were actually born. You may have it on you know, some picture or something that might remind you of the, that time. But not one of us had a single thing to do with that in the same way, God changes our heart. He brings us to the point of new birth. We were born again. Not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So my friends, the application for us is clear as well. God is patient. He is long-suffering. He's slow to wrath. Just like the man who waited for three years before he said, just cut this fig tree down. It's not bearing fruit. It's not being fruitful. It's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's not showing that it's a fig tree. God is patient. God is long-suffering. He's slow to wrath, but it doesn't mean that judgment isn't coming. It is. <laughs> and it will happen suddenly. It will happen with great decisiveness. Remember what Peter wrote to the Christians of his day? As they were undergoing persecution, as they were undergoing martyrdom under Nero, Emperor Nero, Probably the worst example of a Roman emperor that we can think of. He said this in 2 Peter 3, 9. You might want to jot this down. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Now, it's interesting because Peter's talking to the church. He's talking to believers when he says that all, not wishing that any should perish of you, but that all of you should reach repentance. And you think, haven't they already repented? He's, he's talking to them. He's not willing, not slow, but he's patient toward you, toward the church, toward this body of believers. Not wishing that any should perish. What does that tell us? It tells us that not all who claim the name of Jesus, who speak the name of Jesus, and who have, who have professed the name of Jesus are actually confessing Him. Not all have truly repented. Not all have truly been saved. Who even claim to be saved. Some, there's a possibility of being self-deluded. There's a possibility that the gospel you responded to is not a gospel at all, but was some... Something else. Something different. So this is the, ap the application of the parable. Fruitfulness in the Christian life means putting on display the likeness of Christ, the character of Christ, this love, His joy, His peace, His patience, His kindness, His gentleness, His meekness, His faithfulness, His self-control. This is the lifestyle of the one who's been genuinely converted, who is... Truly come to faith in Christ. 
And so I ask, are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you like this fig tree? Having all the outward signs of a fig tree, but showing no fruit and therefore good for nothing but to be cut down. To be thrown into the fire, Jesus says in another place. So are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? And how do you know? What assurance, what measure of assurance do you have? Are you living out of repentance as a lifestyle? By the way, you can have full assurance of faith in Christ. If you trust in Him, you can have full assurance of that faith. And you'll know that once you have trusted in Him savingly, that's something that can never be undone. You will persevere until the end, even if you fail, even if you fall, even if there is sin along the way, the Lord will bring you back to himself. But are you living that as a lifestyle? Are you walking in faith away from sin and in step with the Lord Jesus? And if not, why not? And it's possible that you have in the past and you've taken a step away. To you, Jesus says, come, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Are you living a life marked by fruitfulness in the Christian life? And can others see that fruitfulness? These are questions I want you to think about and ask yourself, along with some other questions for reflection. What evidence in your life suggests you genuinely repented of your sin and trusted Christ for salvation? What evidence suggests that there's spiritual fruit being born as a believer in your life? Is it empty of that fruit? How does this ongoing repentance and ongoing fruitfulness bring assurance of faith to the follower of Christ? And are you experiencing that? Is that something that is true in your life? And what is the next step you need to take on your journey with God today? Would you join me in prayer this morning? Just bowing together before the Lord just in the quietness of these moments. Just focusing on the Lord. Focusing on what He has spoken to us in His Word and how we are to respond. Perhaps you need to do business with God today for the very first time, or perhaps there's some other need that you need to bring to Him. Whatever the case, take these moments, think about it, pray. Father, in these moments we pray that Christ would have his full way in our hearts and our lives. Pray that the Holy Spirit would be about his office work doing what only he can do. The work of conviction. Righteousness and judgment come, reminding us of what Jesus has done to save us. His perfect life, his death on the cross, his resurrection in the body, his ascension back to heaven, his seating, being seated at the right hand of God the Father, and his one day return on the clouds of glory. What well, may we think and consider all of this that we might leave from this place not the same, but changed by you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. As Kyle comes to lead us in our hymn of reflection and commitment. It is number 329, grace greater than all our sin. I'll be standing here at the front. If you want to pray, if you want to make a public confession of faith, trust in Christ, we want to give you the opportunity to do that as well. But let's stand together and as we sing, you may you may just need to be doing business with the Lord right where you're standing. But if there's some change or some, some something that happens to you today, we want to know about that. We'd love for you to share that with us too. So as we sing, you come as the Lord leads. Marvelous grace of our love Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpour, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled, grace, grace, God's grace, grace 
the world pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin, marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestow on all who believe. All who are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, Grace that is greater than all our sins. Amen. 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 The, the message here, repent, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It sounds harsh on the, on the outside, but it's actually a word of mercy. It's a word of grace. It's a word that is a warning that says... There is salvation for those who repent. There is new life for those who turn to Christ. And so I want to encourage you with those words. Kyle, do you share, share an announcement that we had before we leave today? I'm so uh, glad of a great week of Bible school. One of the most exciting things is on Sunday morning um, to have faces in the crowd that we don't normally see in the crowd. Um, I know some of you may attend church somewhere else, and thank you for coming here today and sharing your kids with us. Um, if you don't have a place that you normally come, it is great seeing your face in this crowd. Come every week, um, and just getting to know you guys through the week through Kids Club. We just hope that you'll come back and uh, do what we do every week, which is seek Christ, seek to understand uh, what He has to say to us through His Word, and uh, realizing our sin, realizing our shortcomings, but seeking Him. And we just hope you would join us in doing that. And we sure love to have you anytime. Um, on the back of your bulletin, there are some announcements for things coming up. One of them is um, a movie night, which is August the 7th at 7 o'clock. We uh, finally put that on the calendar for sure with the date and time. So that's August the 7th, Sunday night. Um, the movie is called Mom's Night Out. Now, the movie is not for just moms. It's for everybody to come. But it's a comedy that's uh, been out for a few years, but we've had a few people watch it and they said, it's hilarious, so you'll love it. So come out and watch that with us. Um, we'll try to work it out so that we can uh, maybe watch it in a room where we can have popcorn and not get butter all over the pews. We'll Amen. probably go in the other room and watch it. So come and be, do that, bring, bring everybody, and that'll be a lot of fun. Um, next Sunday, the 31st, we're gonna have a guest speaking in the service, and that is gonna be Joe Nogowski. He is our... Uh, He's the Bob Springgate. If you guys remember Bob Springgate, they used to come around with the ventriloquist dummy. Joe will not bring a ventriloquist dummy, but uh, he's been coming to our uh, brown bag ministers meetings and has been keeping us updated on our uh, Baptist Children's Home and all the ministries there through uh, the Pregnancy Research Center, the, the, the trafficking uh, efforts throughout Missouri to stop sex trafficking and things like that. All that's happening to the Missouri Baptist Children's Home. So he's going to be here to tell you about a lot of that, but I think he's only going to be sharing a message as well from Scripture. Okay, so he's going to be sharing. That is next week. Bring somebody with you to hear that. Um, and check out the rest of those. Um, we are going to Children's Camp August 1st through 5th. 
the deadline has come and gone, but we still have a little bit of room. If you have a child who would like to go who's uh, coming out of fourth grade, fifth grade, or out of sixth grade, let us know. We could make that happen. It's uh, August 1st through 5th. So, Did you say anything about this public bags? Oh, I haven't, don't know the deta details about that. Okay. Um, you want to say something about the support bags? Okay. We will have further information about if you know someone who is in need of school supplies. Um, Dava has a plan to get those to where they are. If you know someone or you are someone, let us know. Okay? That sound good enough? Okay. Right. Thank you. Very good. Other announcements that we have that we need to make sure and mention today? Anyone? All right. I think, uh, I think that's it. Let's stand up together. As we depart this service, we're receiving the blessing from the Lord, from his word. And remember what uh, he said to Moses to say to Aaron to pronounce upon the people. When he said, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all the people said, amen. 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 Talk to someone. If you find someone you haven't seen before or haven't had a chance to get a <laughs>